So giving the next talk will be Nick Spooner, who is going to be talking about proofs of proofs and incrementally verifiable verifiability from recursion and accumulation. Uh, Nick is currently a postdoc at Boston University, um, and he's going to be joining the University of Warwick next year, I think as a professor, as a lecturer. Um, his work focuses on post-quantum proof systems, uh, recursive proof composition and zero knowledge, and two sort of big works that I, that I sort of think are great that he's worked on are Fractal and Aurora. Uh, wait, stage next. Stop sharing. Thank you, Um Just uh, get the. Okay. Uh, can everyone see this? Yes. And hear me? Okay, great. Um, so thanks to the introduction, Mary. Um, I'm going to be talking about. Uh, I'm going to talk about recursive composition of, of proof systems um, and incremental verification. Um, so let's start with uh, with some motivation for this uh, for this line of work, and then I'll explain sort of uh, how we solve these problems. So the problem setup is that you're trying to prove a t-step um, non-deterministic communication. So you have uh, sorry computation. So you have uh, some transition function f, which is like a like a single step of the computation, um, and uh, some initial states at zero, some final target states at t, and you want to check that there exist intermediate states z1 up to zt and intermediate witnesses w0 up to, to wt, such that uh, if you apply the transition function to state i and witness wi, you get the next state zi plus one. So this is sort of a, like a, a, a machine computation. You can think about it like this. Um, and one way to, to prove this is using some sort of monolithic proof system. So, uh, you know, things like like what, what Justin was talking about, uh, like you just take the entire proof, the, the entire transcript of the computation and you just prove it all at once. Um, and this is great. We have lots of great systems for doing this, but it has a couple of uh, uh, significant problems. So one of them is that often these proof systems require a large amount of memory. Um, so if your original computation, uh, like if, if the, the space of your original computation is s, then uh, the size of this transcript is going to be s times t. And so the prover generally needs to, to sort of hold this whole transcript in his head at once in order to do the proof. Um, this is not always true, but often true. And the other sort of more significant thing is that, that uh, if you want to prove one more step of the computation, then you have to start from the beginning again and, and prove everything all over again. This is where uh, a thing called incrementally verifiable computation comes in. So this was introduced, introduced by Valiant in 2008. Uh, and the idea of, of IVC is that you prove everything, you, you prove your computation one step at a time. So uh, you prove that the state Z0, uh, if you apply F becomes Z1 and you output a proof pi one, which then goes into your next proof, proof step that proves that sort of uh, Z0 goes to Z2 and, uh, uh, and outputs a new proof pi two. And so each of these sort of units is, is uh, a fixed size. Um, and what you end up with at the end is a, a final state ZT and a proof pi T that attests to the correctness of the entire computation. But none of the proof units sort of looked at the entire computation at any time. Um, so they're sort of all, all local. Uh, there is a generalization of this, uh, which you might have seen, which is called proof carrying data. Um, and this basically, like if you look at this computation, it sort of looks like a path. Um, and proof carrying data uh, generalizes this to uh, to a general DAG, so you can have a more complicated uh, looking computation. Uh, applications of this include succinct blockchains, um, snarks with low space complexity, verifiable delay, delay functions, and recently uh, some forms of Byzantine agreement. Um, I will not sort of dwell too much on these applications. Uh, mainly, this talk will be about like how we achieve this uh, this exciting primitive. Um, so how do we build IBC? Let's start with so firstly like a, a formal definition. So an IBC scheme consists of two algorithms, a prover and a verifier. Um, and the prover is set up so that you can kind of feed the proof, the, the output of the prover back into itself, right? So um, you can take the, the, so the, the next state and you can feed it, put it into the, into, the, into the next step of the prover and you can take the next proof and you can put it into the, into the next step of the prover in the same way. 
Um, and uh, the so there is a comment. Uh, yeah, so I will be actually talking about um, the so so the, like the. the Darius says there are two conceptions of PCD, one which emphasizes that it's a DAG and one that emphasizes the computation can combine proofs from independent provers. Um, and this is a, a good point, and I will actually be talking about IVC rather than PCD, but the independent provers thing is sort of something that is still relevant here. Um, so here we have sort of a, we have this adversarial completeness property that says that basically um, if the proof verifies, then uh, if you like produce a new step of the proof, then uh, like uh, if you if you like uh, apply the uh, the prover um, to this, then then you will get a proof that verifies again. So this is like no matter where the proof came from, even if it was sort of adversarially generated, it will you will be able to build on it in uh, in the IVC. Um, and the second property is this sort of soundness proof of knowledge property that says that uh, if the adversary is producing like a, a good proof, then he must know the transcript of the computation that, that corresponds to that, to that outcome. So that's IVC. Um, one very important point is that the efficiency uh, is, the efficiency requirement is very strong. Basically the proof should never grow in size. So the output proof should be essentially the same size as the input proof. And this prevents the proof from growing in size over the course of the computation and prevents you from sort of paying in efficiency uh, as you like extend the computation further. Okay, so I'm going to talk today about three ways to construct IVC. Uh, these are sort of three central paradigms and there are various works that, that come under these paradigms. Um, and I'm going to order them, first of all, chronologically, but also uh, sort of in terms of how weak the assumptions or building blocks are that you, you start with. Um, and what's going to happen is actually as you sort of weaken the building blocks, you get sort of weaker guarantees on the efficiency of the IVC verifier in terms of the block circuit F. So the verifier is still sort of always efficient with respect to the number of times you apply F, but uh, not necessarily with respect to the, si the, the, the size of the individual blocks. Um, okay. Uh, Okay, Patricia has said something, but I'm not going to read it because it's very long. Um, <laughs> so, uh, okay, so um, this sort of original way to do this was, was originally proposed by Valiant and formalized by NBCCT 13, um, which is succinct non interactive arguments of knowledge, SNARKs, with sublinear verification. Um, you can, uh, from this, you obtain IVC, where the verifier is actually sublinear in the size of this, in, in the size of F. So like very efficient verify. Um, if you, so this is sort of how things stayed for, for about six years. Um, and then there was a breakthrough result of uh, Bogrig and Hopwood, uh, where they, they realized that so the, you don't really need sublinear verification. You need something, you, you can get away with something weaker called amortized succinctness. Uh, that they call amortized succinctness. Um, this was sort of further formalized in BCMS 20 um, to basically snark what we call snarks with accumulation schemes. Um, and we showed in BCMS 20 that if you, uh, you there is a construction um, that takes this, uh, these snarks with accumulation and produces IVC where the proof is uh, still sublinear, but the verifier sort of need not be. So here we have like, lost a little bit in terms of verifier efficiency, but we've managed to generalize the sort of fundamental building block. Uh, and then even more recently, uh, you know, you, we, you, you can kind of keep pushing at uh, how weak the starting assumption is. Um, and uh, you can start with something called a, a, a NARC with split accumulation, which so a NARC is a SNARC, but not succinct. Um, it's a terrible acronym. Uh, and, uh, um, and if you, and it turns out that you can build uh, IVC from this also, this sort of weaker object, and this gives you IVC where not only is the, the verifier potentially sort of slower in terms of F, but also the, the proof is larger. Um, and uh, I want to say that, that uh, so there are a number of works that all do like quite similar things. So I've, I've shown them in red here. The reason that I am highlighting sort of 
uh, I appear to be highlighting my work is that, that there is a sort of certain th thread of concepts that I, that I want to present. Um, I'm not saying that sort of that, that like this is uh, you know the right way of looking at things, but this is the way that I that I understand them. Um, I will say that the the work like well, the things I will be presenting are sort of the most general way of understanding these schemes. So if you understand this stuff, uh, like if you understand accumulation, you'll also understand private aggregation, amortizing things, etc. Um, okay, so this is the the setting. Um, one thing that that uh, that does happen, so like uh, you know, you you can weaken the building blocks, but then what does that buy you? Okay, it reduces verifier efficiency, but is there like anything good that happens? And one thing that happens is that generally, as you go down the slide, the cost of the recursive step decreases. So so you're 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 like paying in the in the IBC verifier, but the cost of the actual recursive step, so you know the recursive prover application, if you like, is uh, is going down. Um, the other thing is that you can instantiate the weaker building blocks from simpler tools. Uh, so what I mean by this, um, so the sort of most complex thing, you need some fairly heavy cryptography or information theory to make it work. You need pairings or you need like uh, full PCPs and IOPs to, to make this work. Um, arguably simpler uh, in a product argument, which is what you can use to, to make the, this middle thing work. Um, and then if you're willing to sort of weaken to the, the, the sort of bottom of the slide, you can actually build these things from uh, quite simple Sigma protocols that are very easy to ask, sort of think about and analyze. Um, all of these arrows in the middle, um, we sort of call this collection of techniques recursive composition. Um, and uh, I'm gonna sort of mainly focus on, on these arrows and not so much how you build the things on the left. Um, some things about recursive composition. Uh, generally, if you define things correctly, then it pre preserves zero knowledge and it preserves post quantum security from the things on the left to the things on the right. Um, and also, uh, there's sort of a general transformation that you can do where you can compose your IVC with a snark. And this gives you some kind of succinct verification, although it's not really the same as uh, succinct verifier IVC. Okay. Uh, finally, uh, all of these constructions use sort of nasty assumptions. So like the, the, even the simplest ones are using assumptions that we are as cryptographers not very comfortable with. Um, so this is either sort of knowledge of X-Men type assumptions or um, like non-black box use of the random oracle. Okay. Uh, so let's, without further ado, let's, let's jump into some constructions. So I'm gonna sort of go, I guess, quite high speed through these things. Um, so we're going to start with a with a snark, and we're going to build IBC. Here's how you do it. Uh, so the IBC prover um, takes as input a state and a proof, and outputs a state and a proof. Uh, so the way that you update the state is you go from uh, you know you apply f to go from z t to z t plus one. And if you didn't have the the proof pi t, then you could just like apply the snark prover to f, and you would get a, a proof of uh, of like the single step. To sort of boost this to a proof of the complete computation before. What you do is you invoke the snark verifier inside of inside of the prover, and you create this uh, this circuit that both verifies the proof and verifies the transition, and this is the circuit that you prove. The IVC verifier is just uh, exactly the snark verifier, just applied to the circuit R. Um, in terms of completeness, it follows from the snark completeness. Uh, soundness is via this recursive extraction type thing which requires a fairly strong extraction guarantee. It's sort of stronger than the standard knowledge property. Um, and for efficiency, well, the size of the proof is always the size of a snark proof for R, which sort of seems great, right? Because R is like a fixed circuit and like, uh, you know, so we'll just get the same size of proof over and over again. Um, but this is sort of where this sublinear verification comes in because in order for, uh, in order to prove a statement about the snark verifier, the verifier for a statement needs to be smaller than the statement itself in order that it sort of fits inside of itself. Uh, so in order for this proof to not grow, we need to, you know, in order for this to be stable, we need, we need sublinear verification. Um, so the question is, what do we do if your snark does not have sublinear verification? Um, and one answer is, uh, is atomic accumulation. So, an atomic accumulation scheme is is described best in terms of a uh, in terms of a sort of stream of data. 
And the problem you want to solve is that you have some predicate phi, which takes in an input and output 0, 1. And you want to compute the conjunction across this stream, uh, say 1 up to t, of, uh, of whether phi of qi is equal to 1. Um, and an accumulation scheme gives you a way to do that uh, using the help of an, an untrusted prover. Uh, and in this way, you save computation. So you start with this, this object called an accumulator. And what a prover does is he takes in an accumulator and an, an input, and he produces a new accumulator. Um, and he does this for every single input. Uh, we have a verifier, which we is controlled by us. And uh, we uh, use it at each step to check the prover's work. Um, and then finally, there is like a final uh, out, like a decision algorithm that takes in an accumulator and tells you whether an accumulator is sort of good. Um, and the guarantee that we have is that if the verifier accepts in every step and the decider also accepts, then uh, this implies that the uh, conjunction is, uh, is one. Um, so uh, where, where do we save? Well, if the verifier is much cheaper than the, than the predicate itself, then the total work is going to be t times the verifier plus the decider. And the decider might be you know, quite expensive, but you only ever do it once. And so this is potentially much smaller than the size of the predicate, you know, t times the size of the predicate. Um, crucially, the uh, accumulator itself does not grow with t. And so the, the, in particular, the efficiency of the decider is independent of t. Uh, so this, uh, uh, special cases of this are this nested amortization uh, thing from, from HALO and also uh, public aggregation schemes. Um, this is, in particular, if you set phi to be like a polynomial commitment checking predicate, then, then this is what you get. Um, how do you build IBC from this? Uh, well, what you can do is you can start with an accumulation scheme for the snark verifier itself, right? So you talk, so you have a snark, and then you have an accumulation scheme for the snark verifier, uh, which remember need not be uh, need not be sublinear at this point. Um, and the prover is now going to take in uh, so so the IVC proof now consists of a snark proof and an accumulator, um, and the state update is the same as before. Um, Again, you can, you know, if you want once one step, you just prove it. Um, and then the way that you prove sort of the, the prior steps is first you run the accumulation prover to accumulate the, the previous information. Um, so that goes into the accumulator. Uh, and then you run the accumulation verifier inside of the snark prover to check that the prover, the accumulation prover that you run that you ran did its job properly. So the, the sort of the new accumulator is correct. Uh, and this is all wrapped up in the circuit R. The IBC verifier consists of two components. It consists of the decider for the accumulation scheme and the, the snark verifier. So uh, which in this case is potentially superlinear. So notice that here the recursive circuit does not contain the snark verifier. And so we sort of avoided this need for sublinearity. Um, soundness relies on knowledge properties from the snark, but only a soundness property of the accumulation scheme, which is kind of nice. Um, however, we still have this problem that the accumulation verifier has to be sublinear. Um, so in particular, like uh, the proof, the snark proof and the accumulator must both be sublinear. And so the question is, you know, what if you don't even have sublinear proofs? Like, can we push this further and say, uh, you know, you don't even have a snark, you have some argument that doesn't have sublinear proofs, can you still build IPC from it? And the answer is again, yes, so long as you have uh, another sort of more general property than accumulation. Um, so split accumulation is now uh, defined in terms of a stream of data, but where, you, where the data is split up into instance parts and witness parts. Um, and you have this relation R, which uh, takes in, uh, which takes in an instance and a witness and output zero or one. Um, and what again, what you want to prove is that uh, is that there exist, or what you want to know is do there exist witnesses such that uh, the relation is satisfied for all of these cues? Um, we have a few questions in the chat, so I'm going to say a minute warning. Uh, okay, great. Um, so in that case, I'm going to sort of zip through this. Basically, the the, the idea is the same. So there's just going to be uh, you're going to sort of accumulate things. Um, using the prover, but now the accumulator is, is bigger, which means that 
the verifier actually can't read the entire thing because we also we still want the verifier to be small and so there's going to be some part of the accumulator that is uh, that is succinct that the verifier will read um, and this is sort of how you build this such a thing uh, the decision is the same and the guarantee is the same um, and so the reason why it helps is also the same but notice now that the accumulator and the 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 data can actually be quite large but there is sort of a part of it that you look at that is uh, that is small um, and this is uh, strongly related to uh, to private aggregation and unfolding schemes. Um, okay, uh, so building ABC from split accumulation, uh, it's essentially the same as before, but you just feed only the instance parts of so that you split up the proof into short parts and long, a short part and a long part, and you only feed the short part of the proof and the accumulator into the verifier. So now like the proof doesn't even need to be short. The accumulator only reads a little bit of, uh, of both of the proof and the, uh, sorry, the, of the, so the, the accumulation verifier reads only a little bit of the proof in the previous accumulator. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip this about cycles of elliptic curves. I think it's interesting, but you know, I, I do not have any time. Um, I wanna show like a, like a pretty graph. So this is from some implementations uh, of, of, uh, of different, different methods. So this, this yellow curve here is what is, uh, is actually y equals x, but this is like a log linear, so it looks exponential. Um, this is the recursion threshold, and this is the point at which you can fit the verifier for a scheme inside of the recursive circuit, like inside of the circuit that is verifying. So like once, like everything to the uh, underneath this curve is sort of feasible for recursion. Um, and uh, what this graph shows is that uh, for the succinct verifier thing, you have this sort of flat recursive overhead. Uh, for atomic accumulation, you have a logarithmic recursive overhead. And uh, for split accumulation, you have a very low recursive overhead. Um, so this is sort of the, the amount of extra work you need to do to recurse versus just to prove a, prove a single a single unit, basically. Um, uh, however, th these numbers look too high to me. Um, there's lots uh, of constraints there. Well, what's the measure? Is that R1CS or? Yeah, it's R1CS. And I should say that this is like unoptimized in some sense. Like this is really, I'm just trying to give like a, like relative uh, numbers. Okay. Um, and I, I think it's so, so my understanding is that this, this orange line, for example, it can be pushed down quite a bit. Um, but uh, the maybe even closer to the to the green line, I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, it's it's something that is still sort of increasing, whereas the green and gray ones are, are flat. Um, I, I'm, I'm itching to give benchmarks for Halo 2, but I can't do that right now. Okay, well, I, I look forward to seeing them and then uh, then maybe I can even update the graph or Pratush can do it because uh, that's, that's his job. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, so there's some implementation work which I also won't talk about because I'm out of time. Uh, basically, uh, a lot of this stuff is implemented by by ArcWorks or will be available soon. There's also other implementations of uh, of certain schemes. I think that they're, they're both sort of Halo based um, that are available. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Okay. okay, I don't have access to all of the questions that were in the chat because I lost my internet connection at a very annoying time. So if people could sort of please read out your questions, that would be excellent. <laughs> uh, okay, so firstly, uh, the the credit for the NARC acronym is uh, Alessandro Chiesa. I want this recorded for posterity. Um, <laughs> uh, in the PCD setting, how do you know? How do you avoid that the same proof is being reused at different branches in the DAG? I guess you don't even think about that. Um, you, it, you could, you could potentially reuse the proof, same proof in different branches of the DAG, and like so long as, I guess, uh, I guess this wouldn't really like if you reuse the same proof in different branches of the DAG. This would sort of mean that the computation actually merges at that point. Like the, it's sort of uh, like if you have two nodes that use the same. The, the prove the same statement, then you can think of them as being one node, really. Um, if you did want to prevent that, then you could encode that in the statement. You, you yeah, exactly right. So you, if you if, if that was something you wanted to enforce, that could be enforced by sort of the the structure of the um, like uh, by this like predicate f. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, is it valid to say that before recursion, we were able to get fast verification only for either machine computations or circuits, and with recursion, we can combine both? Uh, yeah, I, I think that's not really, um, 
accurate. I think what, what Pratish says is, uh, is basically the, the case. Like the, I mean, recursion is a way to combine different kinds of protocols because you can sort of uh, prove one thing, like prove a, uh, the verifier of one protocol with another. This is also something that you do to take advantage of cycles. Um, but uh, yeah, I think this, this is sort of maybe an independent concern. Like you can, you can already combine uh, like different styles of protocols. It's just one way to do that. Um, and yes, the cycles, the benchmarks are using cycles. I think if they did not have cycles in them, they would be absolutely horrendous. Um, uh, okay. Uh, uh, which, which cycle are they using? Uh, so the, let me do the, I have, I had a slide yeah, uh, stuff on. Yeah, so the, sorry, go, go on, Pratusha. I guess you know more about this. <laughs> I think BCDB14, they used in their original evaluation, the MNT four six cycles on 320 bit curves, but now you have to use a 768 or 753 bit MNT curves, which are much slower. Um, but for when we were evaluating BCMS20 and BCLMS20, we used the pasta cycle. Okay, thanks. Oh, well, thank you very much for a great talk. And thank you to both our speakers, actually. Thank you. Oh, oh by the way, it might be um, a good opportunity to say that I've generated a half pairing cycle. So that's um, one pairing friendly curve and one um, non pairing curve called um, Pluto Eris. Um, so that's, uh, I'll, I'll put the link to that in the chat. Yeah, great. But that has the, the nice engineering the that Pasta has. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I I was going to to mention this, uh, but I, in, in my in my uh, cycles of elliptic curve slide, which you can uh, which you can feel free to read. Uh, <laughs> um, so thank you so much again uh, to Justin, to Nick, and thanks.